Professor for Cognitive Neuroscience at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's also the author of a previous book called The Language Instinct. He spoke at an event hosted by the MIT Libraries and the MIT Press Bookstore. I was feeling pretty good when I came in, but I feel miserable now. There's a, I was sitting here, and there's this kid sitting behind me, and he says to me, uh, how long have I been at MIT? And I said, since 1977. And he said, that's when I was born. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> and then I thought to myself, MIT students really know how to hurt a guy. <laughs> I've actually known, uh, let's see, if you've been here since 77, that makes you 20. I've known... Uh, I've actually known Steve Pinker all of your life. <laughs> uh, Steve, uh, let's see, I have some notes here so I don't have to remember these details. Steve was, uh, he did his uh, BA at uh, McGill in experimental psychology, uh, in psychology, and then he got his PhD from Harvard uh, in 79, 79 to 80. He was a postdoc here at MIT in the Center for Cognitive Science. Then he went to Harvard, Stanford, and MIT was smart enough to get him back uh, in 1982, and he's been here uh, ever since. Uh, he was, he has been during that time, uh, uh, the co-director the co of the Center for Cognitive Sciences and is currently director of the McDonald, McDonald Pew Center for Cognitive Neuroscience at MIT. He's had innumerable awards, I always remember the flashy ones, like uh, he was an Esquire um, choice for one of the, what was it, 40 most promising young people in the United States, and, uh, and that was, uh, that's just one of them. He had it uh, from the American Psychological Association, Distinguished Scientific Award, when he was 84, in 1984. <laughs> <laughs> That'll teach you. <laughs> Uh, you should know a bit about his research interests, so I'm going to tell you that his uh, research includes empirical studies of linguistic behavior and theoretical analyses of the nature of language and its relation to mind and brain. Uh, he says, on the empirical side, I study specific modules of grammar from a variety of disciplines, much as biologists direct focus on a few model organisms. And he um, goes on to discuss the work that he's currently doing with in his laboratory here at MIT. Much of this information is available to you uh, publicly, so I don't really want to spend a lot of time on it. There are a few things that uh, I wanted to um, call to your attention. You may have seen the um, article on Friday in the Boston Globe, front page news, Steve Pinker, professors battle over Darwin's concept of evolution, survival of the theorists, it says. And the opening, uh, uh, the opening sentence, I think, can't be um, uh, improved on. With his rock star mass of curly locks and his breezy rhetorical style, MIT Steven Pinker doesn't match the image that fundamentalist usually calls to mind. Then the article goes on to discuss the debate that he's involved in with Dan Dennett and Stephen Jay Gould uh, over um, uh, evolution. Uh, the reference to his breezy rhetorical style, I think, is a nice reference, but it really doesn't do him credit. Steve found a uh, terrific voice to be able to do something that, at least in my field, linguists had always sort of agonized over not being able to do, that is to say, making the study of mind seen through language accessible to uh, the uh, um, larger reading public. Uh, it's a wonderful gift. Uh, he found a voice, and it's a terrific voice, and you'll see that almost every commentator uh, talks about it. Uh, how many of you have not read uh, uh, yet The Language Instinct? Could I see your hands? Okay, so that's enough. Uh, to warrant my reading, just a little, I'm just going to read you a paragraph from The Language Instinct. Uh, he has a wonderful chapter, not surprisingly a chapter which, called, uh, which uh, 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 attracted a lot of attention, called The Language Mavens. And the chapter is about these people like William Satfire and the like who sort of tell people how to speak correctly. And here's, a, I won't say any more than, uh, he quotes from a column from a, sapphire, uh, from a sapphire story. Sapphire replies to a diplomat who received a government warning about, quote, crimes against tourists, primarily robberies, muggings, and pickpocketings. The diplomat writes, 
Note, quote, note the State Department's choice of pickpocketings. Is the doer of such deeds a pickpocket or a pocket picker? Sapphire replies the sentence should read robberies, muggings, and pocket pickings. One picks pockets, no one pockets picks. <laughs> and Steve says, significantly, Sapphire did not answer the question. If the perpetrator were called a pocket picker, which is the most common kind of compound in English, then indeed the crime would be pocket picking. But the name for the perpetrator is not really up for grabs. We all agree that he is called a pickpocket, and if he is called a pickpocket, not a pocket picker, then what he does can perfectly well be called pickpocketing, not pocket picking, thanks to the ever-present English noun to verb conversion process, just as cooks cook, a chair chairs, and a host hosts. The fact that no one pockets picks is a red herring. Who said anything about a pickpocketer? <laughs> That's really good, Steve. <laughs> Okay, so um, how do I end this? Well, I don't know, Steve, uh, thank you. Uh, oh, who did that? Send him out. <laughs> Steve, excuse me, but the, the first time, with his rock star mass of curly locks and his breezy rhetorical style, reminded me of Judy Garland's version of the trolley song. So I'd like to sing, sing myself out. <laughs> Uh, with his rock star mess of curly locks and his breezy rhetorical style, he's come to lecture to us of things non-superfluous, wisdom with a smile. Thank you, Jay, and thanks, thank you, MIT Press Bookstore, for making this evening possible. It's a great honor to be able to speak in front of so many uh, colleagues, students, and friends. The human mind is one of the last great frontiers of science and is truly a magnificent organ. It has allowed us to walk on the moon, to uh, discover the secrets of life and the physical universe, and to play chess almost as well as a computer. But the <laughs> mind raises uh, many paradoxes. On the one hand, the human mind is an engineering uh, masterpiece. We can see, move, and use common sense better than any existing or for foreseeable computer or robot. On the other hand, the mind has many apparent quirks. For example, why is the thought of eating worms disgusting? Worms are a perfectly uh, nutritious source of protein. Why do men challenge each other to duels and murder their ex-wives? Why do fools fall in love? <laughs> Why do people believe in ghosts and spirits? Well, the goal of how the mind works is to explain both of these kinds of uh, feats using three key ideas. The first idea is computation, that just as the function of the heart is to pump blood and the function of the kidneys is to filter the blood, the function of the brain is information processing or computation. Let me explain uh, what that means. There's an old problem in uh, philosophy. Uh, if you wanted to explain a person's behavior, say, why did Bill just get on the bus? You wouldn't run a uh, mathematical simulation of a neural network. You wouldn't have to put his head in a scanner. Your best bet would be just to ask him. And he would say, I want to get on the bus because I want to visit my grandmother, and I know that the bus will take me to uh, my grandmother's house. That's a, uh, an excellent predictor of his behavior. If he hated the sight of his grandmother, or if he knew that the bus route had changed, his body wouldn't be on that bus. But the paradox uh, of that is that beliefs and desires, the causes of John's uh, behavior, are colorless, odorless, tasteless, and weightless. Nonetheless, they are as potent a cause of behavior as one billiard ball clacking into another. So how do we explain this? It's uh, one of the two parts of what has traditionally been called the mind-body problem. And I think the solution comes in two parts. One is that beliefs and desires are information, where information consists of patterns in matter or energy that correlate with states in the world. We can say that a tree stump uh, carries information about the age of the tree because the number of rings correlates with the uh, number of years the tree has been growing. Second, that beliefs and desires can have effects through computation, and I'm going to give a very general and abstract definition of computation. It occurs in a device that's designed to process information in which patterns cause other patterns, and the changes from pattern to pattern mirror the laws of logic, statistics, or cause and effect in the world. 
which means that if the old information represented in the device was true, the new information will also be true if the device is contrived so that the physical changes uh, mirror or are isomorphic to laws of cause and effect or logic or statistics. And deducing new truths from old truths in pursuit of a goal is not a bad definition of intelligence. And it's been around with us since the time of William James. So that, in a nutshell, is the, what's called the computational theory of mind. It solves the mind-body problem, uh, at least one part of it, because uh, just as beliefs and desires are colorless, odorless, and tasteless, but can cause behavior, we know that information, being a mathematical concept, is also colorless, odorless, and tasteless. But physical devices that carry information can, by obeying the laws of physics, cause systematic uh, patterns of changes uh, that can well be characterized in this abstract language of information. Note that the computational theory of mind is not the same thing as the computer metaphor, the idea that the human brain is like a digital computer. It most decidedly is not. The uh, brain, as many people have pointed out, is parallel, whereas computers are serial. Computers are very uh, fast. The elements of uh, the brain are comparatively slow. Computers run uh, screensavers with flying toasters. Brains don't. But the point isn't that commercially available computers are a good metaphor for the mind. The point is that part of the answer to the question of what makes a computer smart can also be applied to understanding what makes a brain smart. The computational theory of mind also guides the, the stu direct study of the physiology of the brain. An old uh, pseudo question that uh, you sometimes hear in uh, introductory psychology after you show a diagram of the eyeball, which shows an image of the world projected onto the retina that's upside down, sometimes people wonder, well, if the image on the retina is upside down, does that mean that there's some part of the brain that sort of turns the image around right side up so that we can see the world as it is right side up? Now, this is a, a, uh, a pseudo question. There, need not be any such process in the brain, because whether the retinal image is upside down or right side up makes no difference as to how the brain processes the information coming from it. And the information is the only property of, neuro of activity in the brain that's relevant to explaining uh, the mind. Finally, the computational theory is not just an answer to uh, a problem in philosophy textbooks, but it really changes how we understand uh, behavior in even in terms of our day-to-day -day explanations. It's the idea that the mind runs on information is in stark contrast to our folk theory, the one that we use in ordinary conversation, which really talks as if the mind runs on energy or pressure. For example, you often read or hear things like the following. If only Fred had an outlet so that he could vent his hostility and channel his rage rather than bottling it up, he wouldn't have exploded last Tuesday and shot up the post office with an Uzi. <laughs> now, this is... Uh, this is a metaphor of the mind as bad plumbing, as uh, some source of uh, pressurized uh, hot fluid that drives our thoughts and feelings. Since we know from the study of the brain that there is no uh, vessel of pressurized fluid, the fact that people behave as if there is really is showing that the brain has been contrived to simulate uh, this kind of metaphor, and it leads us to ask the question, why would the uh, brain be rigged up to run a cunning simulation of this kind of system? That's a question that I'll return to uh, soon. The second idea is evolution. It begins with the question, how do we understand a complex device? For example, this device over here. Now, if I were to tell you that uh, this device just um, what spewed out of a volcano and the congealed lava just happened to form in exactly this shape, you would be very skeptical. It has too many parts that seem to be arranged to uh, result in some outcome for it to have uh, occurred by random chance processes, by some process that's insensitive to what the device can accomplish. Instead, we uh, understand it by a process called reverse engineering. We figure it, it, it has too many parts to have been arranged by chance. It must have been created by a designer with some goal in mind. In this case, the device, I believe, is a uh, cherry pitter. The blade over here makes an incision in one end of the cherry. You put it on the other side, and it pushes the pit through the uh, slot. Uh, and 
only when we know what the device was designed to do can we really claim to understand it. Can we claim to understand why it has four sharp points here or a um, spring-loaded uh, handle uh, over here? If we thought that it was a, you know, the latest Nordic track device for exercising your wrist, whoops, we would have a very different uh, uh, understanding of how it works. Now, from centuries, we've known that bodies are complex devices. For example, the human eye, uh, like this gadget over here, has many parts that are intricately arranged to accomplish some outcome, namely focusing an image on a layer of light-sensitive tissue. And it's astronomically, um, the odds are astronomically low that something as complicated as the eye could have arisen as a byproduct uh, of the growth of some of a tumor or a wart. Uh, instead, we say that the we explain the various parts of the eye by saying that it was in some sense designed to form an image. Now, of course, in the biological world, uh, unless you're a creationist, there is no conscious design by a designer. Rather, Darwin explained signs of engineering in the natural world in terms of the process of natural selection. That is, when there are physical replicators that compete for limited resources, the ones that have the highest reproduction rates will prevail, and over many generations, the resulting system will show signs of engineering that often mimic, in important ways, man-made engineering. Now, the punchline is that the mind is a complex device. It's presumably more complex than this. Uh, it is complex enough that we can't duplicate its simple functions like seeing or retrieving information in a computer or a robot. And this, less, this leads to um, the uh, idea that to understand the mind, you have to reverse engineer it. Now, in forward engineering, you have a, uh, a goal that you want your device to accomplish, and you go out and you build the device. In reverse engineering, you start with the device, and you have to figure out what it was designed to do. If uh, what I'm saying has merits, psychology would be a, a discipline of reverse engineering the human mind. And just as uh, understanding this as being a cherry pitter leads to a different theory than if you understand it as a wrist exerciser, the crucial question in understanding the mind is what its func is its function? What did natural selection uh, engineer it to do? And the answer from Darwinian theory is that it is engineered for survival and reproduction in the environment in which we evolved, namely the environment of hunting and gathering tribes that prevailed until very recently in our evolutionary history. The third idea is specialization, that uh, I'm not going to give you some single uh, uh, almighty mathematical principle or show you how the brain contains some kind of wonder tissue that can do uh, miraculous mind-like things. Rather, the mind is a complicated device like the Apollo spacecraft that has to solve many uh, different kinds of engineering problems, seeing in three dimensions, moving arms and legs, understanding the physical world, finding and keeping mates, securing allies, and many others. These problems are different, and the tools for solving them are different. We know that specialization is ubiquitous in biology in general. The uh, heart has a different shape than the lungs because the heart is designed to pump bl blood and the lungs are designed to oxygenate it. The uh, tissues from which the heart is made are different from uh, lung tissue. The heart cells are different from lung cells. The specialization goes all the way down. And I'm going to suggest that the mind, like the body, is organized into mental systems, organs, and tissues, that there is a complex heterogeneous structure to the mind. So to sum up, the thesis of how the mind works is that the mind is a system of organs of computation that allowed our ancestors to understand and outsmart objects, animals, plants, and each other. And the examples I'm going to present are uh, one example from seeing, one from thinking, one from our emotions about things. And the most interesting is our emotions about people, because people can have emotions back, and that makes the story much more interesting. Let me start out with seeing. If um, anyone who's uh, seen movies about robots knows that when the uh, cinematographer wants to show the world from a robot's eye view, they'll basically show a video image of the world uh, decorated with some contrivance like crosshairs or pull-down menus or a fisheye distortion or a red tint. You've all seen this from The Terminator and HAL in 2001 and so on. This is a very misleading uh, portrayal of what goes on when a, a human or a robot sees. If you could see the world through a robot's eyes or through your 
from your brain's vantage point, it wouldn't look like a video image with some crosshairs, but it would look something like this. That is, millions of uh, values of variables corresponding to the intensity of light at uh, the various locations on the retina, a two-dimensional projection of the three-dimensional world uh, in front of the eye or in front of the camera. And the task of the brain is to crunch these numbers and recover an understanding of the three-dimensional structure of the world from the uh, mosaic of intensities. The brain has evolved many tricks for doing it. One of them is called uh, shape from shading, and it works off a simple law of physics. So I'll illustrate with this visual aid. Basically, the, roughly the steeper the angle of a surface, the less light it reflects back. So as I rotate the card with respect to the light source, the blob of light that's reflected on it goes from uh, bright to dim. Okay. Now, that's a bit of physics that's true of uh, the way that light reflects off objects, and a bit of psychology that evolved to take advantage of that physical law would run it backwards and say that the dimmer a patch on the retina, the steeper the angle of the surface in the world. And would, therefore, the brain would be able to reconstruct a shape from the angles of the thousands of facets that collectively define the three-dimensional shape of a surface. The only problem with this shape from shading trick is that it interprets brightness as angle and therefore assumes a uniformly or at least a randomly colored world. It assumes that any difference in lightness or darkness on the retina comes from a difference in angle and ultimately shape in the world. Now that's a, uh, an assumption that's obviously not generally true. And it predicts that surfaces that are colored in clever ways should fool the shape from shading module and actually cause us to uh, see things that aren't there. In fact, that is exactly what happens, and many of the contrivances of modern life take advantage of this. For example, uh, television is a kind of illusion. If a, an alien anthropologist were to visit this planet, uh, it would surely be astonished to find that uh, people in this country spend eight hours a day uh, staring at a pane of glass. Now, why do people stare at the pane of glass? Well, it's designed so that it displays patterns of shading that our shape from shading analyzer uh, interprets as coming from three-dimensional objects. And so we stare at the pane of glass uh, because the pane of glass has been engineered to defeat this part of our brain and cause us to hallucinate a real world behind the glass. Uh, another example is makeup. That people who are skilled at applying makeup know that if someone has a nose that's too big, you can make it look smaller by putting a little bit of rouge on the sides. The brain interprets uh, dark as steeper angle, hence skinnier nose. Conversely, if you put a little bit of white powder on the upper lip, bright means um, shallow angle, and that gives you the um, sort of full-lipped, pouty, bee-stung look that the models uh, strive so hard to attain. <laughs> More generally, I think that many of the illusions, fallacies, and maladaptive behaviors are like makeup and television. They come from a mismatch between assumptions about an ancestral world that are built into our mental modules and the structure of the current world. A long-standing puzzle for uh, Darwinian theorists of behavior is why people do seemingly maladaptive things like eating junk food, using contraceptives, or gambling. And a reasonable answer is that our psychology, our mental modules, assume a world in which sweet foods are nutritious, which was true when the only sweet foods in the environment were ripe fruit, where sex leads to babies, which was true until the invention of contraception, and in which statistical patterns have underlying causes, which was true until the invention of precision gambling devices like roulette wheels, decks of cards, uh, even pennies, and so on. Let me turn now to an example from thinking. A, a problem that also bedeviled uh, Darwinians in the 19th century was what do hunter-gatherers do with their capacity for abstract intelligence? Uh, hunter-gathering tribes uh, have all the mental equipment necessary to do uh, calculus and chess and science, but why would there have been selection for that ability in an environment in which uh, these uh, abilities would never have been put to use? I think um, the question of what hunter-gatherers do with their abstract intelligence, however, could probably be posed with more justification by hunter-gatherers about American couch potatoes. 
basically life for hunters and gatherers, including our ancestors, was a camping trip that never ended, but without the freeze-dried pasta and Swiss army knives and uh, uh, space blankets. Basically, our ancestors had to live by their wits and outsmart the denizens of the biological world in order to earn a living. And the anthropologist John Tooby said that a biologist might well say that the human species entered the cognitive niche. The best definition of the cognitive niche comes from Ambrose Bierce's Devil's Dictionary in his definition of man. Man, noun, an animal so lost in rapturous contemplation of what he thinks he is as to overlook what he indubitably ought to be. His chief occupation is extermination of other animals and his own species, which, however, multiplies with such insistent rapidity as to infest the whole habitable Earth and Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Now, as a Canadian, I'm outraged. But um, <laughs> on the other hand, it does capture something significant about our species, namely that humans everywhere overtake other organisms' fixed defenses by cause and effect reasoning. Uh, humans in all societies, even the uh, so-called primitive cultures, use ingenious engineering in the form of tools, traps, poisons, plant preparations, medicines, and by coordinating their actions to accomplish what an individual uh, human could not. And that this is based on a kind of intuitive theory that uh, we are all equipped with, or a set of intuitive theories, based on core intuitions about different aspects of the world. The most fundamental of our uh, intuitive theories is an intuitive physics, an understanding of how objects fall, roll, and bounce. The core intuition behind our intuitive physics is that of the stable, law-abiding object. If we didn't believe that the world is populated by objects that continue to exist when we look away and that obey laws, we couldn't uh, under, uh, do either real physics or uh, our intuitive versions. Now, this is a... Um, was not always recognized. William James said that the world of an infant at birth was a blooming, buzzing confusion, that the infant simply experienced reality as a bunch of uncorrelated, shimmering uh, pixels. But recent research by my colleague Elizabeth Spelke and others has shown that even very young infants, as young as they can be tested, about three months old, seem to interpret the world in terms of stable, uh, law-abiding objects. They are visibly surprised if an experimenter rigs up a, a magic display in which objects uh, pass through solid barriers or disappear and reappear or vanish for no good reason. As one uh, developmental psychologist summed up this literature, it's the world of the parents of a young infant that's a blooming, buzzing confusion, <laughs> not the world of the infant. On the other hand, there are objects in our experience that seem to defy the laws of physics. As Richard Dawkins uh, pointed out, if you throw a dead bird in the air, it will describe a graceful parabola and come to rest on the ground, just as the physics books say it should. But if you throw a live bird in the air, it won't describe a graceful parabola and come to land on the ground, but it may not touch land this side of the county boundary. Now, we, in, everyone interprets living things, which are these uh, scoff laws, not as uh, being completely random in their behavior, but obeying a different kind of law, the laws of an intuitive biology, where the core intuition is an essence, a, uh, an internal source of energy or oomph that uh, drives the organism, gives it its form, and orchestrates its uh, bodily processes. It's this understanding uh, of the world that allows hunter-gatherers, and presumably our ancestors, to be excellent amateur biologists. When professional biologists do field work in, um, with native tribes, they are frequently astonished that they have names for hundreds of uh, examples of the local flora and fauna that almost invariably match the Linnaean uh, taxonomy of genus and species. Uh, Hunter-gatherer tribes are also uh, excellent folk physicians and derive medicines and poisons and food additives from the surrounding products that uh, we're only beginning to exploit. All of this uh, comes from an understanding that to understand how a living thing ticks, you've got to look at the stuff that it's made of. This also allows uh, hunter-gatherers to do um, uh, ingenious feats of prediction, such as to know what kind of an animal uh, is around where it is, whether it's hungry or not, tired or not, based on 
uh, its tracks. The tracking abilities of hunters and gatherers are uh, also remarkably sophisticated. Or to remember the location of a flower in the spring and return to it in the fall to uncover a, uh, an underground tuber. Now, there is a third way in which we understand the world around us that we can call uh, intuitive engineering. As you all know, our species is uh, famous for the uh, variety of tools that we've made, and that's been true for millions of years. To understand an artifact or a man-made object, there's a different kind of intuition at work, uh, the function, what someone intends an object to do when they fashioned it. If you go to the store down Mass Ave called uh, Seats, which sells nothing but chairs, you'll find that there's nothing physical that all of the products in the store have in common. To be a chair, you don't have to be made out of a particular kind of stuff. You don't have to have a particular shape. The store sells bean bags, and it sells uh, uh, plastic cylinders. Uh, it could sell amputated uh, elephant's feet, uh, high back dining chairs, and so on. The only thing that all chairs have in common is that someone somewhere designed them with the intent that they hold up a human behind. So it's a very different kind of definition than you see for living things or for physical objects. Finally, we all have an intuitive psychology, where the core intuition is one that I mentioned at the outset of the talk, namely that behavior is caused by beliefs and desires. That's why we understand people uh, by asking them what they want or by looking at their eyes, rather than interpreting them as mechanical wind-up dolls. Now, the evidence, some of the evidence for separate intuitive theories are that young children sharply distinguish between objects, bodies, tools, and minds. They know that uh, a human body should not uh, ricochet around like a billiard ball. They know that you can uh, alter uh, the appearance of an animal, and it stays the same animal. But if you alter a tool, it can become a different tool, and uh, many other kinds of distinctions. These intuitive theories can uh, be teased apart by neurological or genetic diseases, autism, it can be characterized as the absence of an intuitive psychology. And people with autism really do interpret other people as if they were mechanical wind-up dolls. In some cases of brain damage caused by stroke, you can have patients who are unable to name man-made things, but can name uh, natural things. So they can name an, a an apple and a zebra, but can't name a screwdriver or a toaster, or vice versa in different kinds of patients. We also see it in misapplications, where we've got, it's as if we were equipped with these four kinds of mental tool, but we also sometimes have the ability to aim them at objects they were not really designed for. You can interpret slapstick humor as a case where we rapidly switch from interpreting people as uh, using our intuitive psychology as a locus of thoughts and beliefs and desires to interpreting them as a physical object that ignominiously obeys the laws of physics, such as by uh, doing a pratfall. Beliefs in go souls and ghosts are a case of our intuitive psychology running amok and uh, people conceptualizing uh, minds without bodies. That is, divorcing our intuitive psychology from our intuitive biology and inventing a class of entities that uh, really don't exist without bodies. Conversely, animistic religious beliefs, where trees, mountains, or idols are thought to have minds or souls, are a case of illicitly wedding our intuitive psychology to our intuitive biology, engineering, or uh, physics. Let me turn now to uh, emotions about things. And I'll focus on one emotion about uh, the inanimate world, a universal emotion that we call disgust. And I'll illustrate a key feature the psychology of disgust with a, a bit of poetry fondly remembered from my camp days and no doubt familiar to many of you, the uh, classic song, Great Green Globs of Greasy Grimy Gopher Guts, Mutilated Monkey Meat, Concentrated Chicken Feet, Jars and Jars of Petrified Porpoise Pus, and I Forgot My Spoon. How many of you have heard, heard that song? as most of you, certainly people under the age of 40. Now, the, an interesting thing I've discovered about this song is that uh, aside from all of these verses naming uh, disgusting substances, it occurs in variants across the country. Some uh, folklorists no doubt has studied, and there are variants of the lyrics that include on the list French fried eyeballs, little birdies, dirty feet, chopped up baby parakeet, perforated pony's feet, on and on. Now, what's the point of these examples is that the list of disgusting substances is open-ended. Basically, whatever is not permitted is forbidden. Of all of the animal parts, of all of the species 
of all of the, the world, there's a tiny list that we consider palatable, basically the skeletal tissue of uh, cattle, chicken, swine, and a few fish. Everything else, every other body part, every other secretion, every other organism is uh, revolting. Now, <laughs> is this any way to design a rational organism? Well, <clears throat> the, uh, many of these substances are perfectly nutritious. The psychologist Paul Rosen has reverse engineered our sense of disgust and uh, argues that it is. He notes that human beings face the omnivore's dilemma, that unlike dietary specialists in the animal kingdom, such as koala bears who just eat eucalyptus leaves, uh, humans have a vast menu of potential foods to sample from. The downside, of course, is that many of them are poison. Many insects and uh, invertebrates house potent uh, neurotoxins, and even ordinarily safe foods like chicken or beef can be infected with parasites and pathogens, as we've recently been reminded by the uh, mad cow disease scare and the draconian warnings by public health officials to try to prevent us from getting poisoned by our next chicken salad sandwich. Now, the particular uh, pathogens that are um, housed in food vary with the local environment, and Rosen suggests that disgust is a, basically a food poisoning deterrent. We basically use our parents and friends the way uh, kings used to use food tasters, namely, if they ate it and survived, then it's not poison. So it's, uh, anything else is guilty until proven innocent, and that's what accounts for the uh, long list of uh, disgusting f uh, foods. There's another interesting feature of disgust that Rosen mentions, which um, I'll, I'll get to in a minute, but um, in fairness to uh, Jay, an old uh, friend who was kind enough to come to introduce me, uh, I know that partway through a talk, after hearing Pinker drone on and on for half an hour, Jay is probably starting to nod off and could use a good pick-me-up, and I brought a nice iced cappuccino for Jay. Uh, I know he takes it with sugar, so I brought some sugar along. And, oh damn, I forgot the stirrer. <laughs> Thirsty? <laughs> Later, okay. <laughs> now, this illustrates another feature of the psychology of disgust. Contamination by contact. <laughs> that is, if a, an innocent uh, object touches a disgusting substance, then it is permanently disgusting itself, and it contaminates anything that it touches in turn. Even if there is no visible uh, difference in the object after the contact. The intuition is that some kind of indescribably revolting, polluting bits are somehow clinging to the object and infect anything that it touches. Children have a name for it. They call them cooties. <laughs> now, the thing is that children are right. There are cooties. They're called microorganisms. And there's an interesting property of microorganisms which distinguishes them from chemical poisons. Chemical poisons are dose-dependent there can be a, uh, a level below which a poison doesn't do you any harm. But for a microorganism, there is a crucial uh, additional property, namely germs multiply. They multiply exponentially. And so an invisible, untastable, um, uh, contaminating bit, even if it is uh, not perceptible to the senses, could quickly saturate a substance of any size, and therefore it's wise to avoid anything that can be tainted by, con by uh, contact. So it's uh, discussed as a kind of intuitive microbiology where we have a sense of these things called uh, microorganisms, even if they were only uh, discovered by professional science very recently. Finally, let me turn to emotions about people. And the great puzzle there is why are our emotions about people so passionate, involuntary, and seemingly irrational? Some examples are uh, pursuing vengeance until the day you die, uh, defending your honor, uh, stabbing the guy who disses your sneakers, uh, challenging people to duels, or falling uh, head over heels in love. Now, the theory that most of us have grown up with is what I'll call the romantic theory. It comes from the romantic movement of the uh, early 19th century, that we all have inherited a well of energy. This is the old the hydraulic metaphor that I mentioned earlier. It's part of our heritage from nature. 
uh, and that it's irrational and maladaptive unless it's channeled into art and creativity. And this theory uh, exists in dozens of uh, forms. It's part of Freudian theory. It's part of our everyday way of talking. I'm going to suggest an alternative, <clears throat> what I'll call the strategic theory, that passion is a paradoxical tactic in the language of game theory. That, it, that the sacrifice of freedom and rationality sometimes gives you an advantage in promises, threats, and uh, bargaining. This is a theory that's been pr proposed by a number of uh, game theorists and economists. And I'll, just to show how unromantic it is, I'll illustrate it by one theory uh, where I'll try to reverse engineer romantic love. <laughs> now, Unsentimental social scientists and veterans of the dating scene uh, agree on one thing, <laughs> that mating marriage is a kind of marketplace, that all of us are in search of the best looking, smartest, nicest, funniest, richest person who will settle for us. <laughs> so there's a kind of a smart shopping is part of what goes on in the, uh, the mating marketplace. But of course, the um, your dreamboat, the best person that uh, you're matched with, is a needle in a haystack, and you might die single if you uh, wait until he or she shows up. So there's a trade-off of the value of a potential mate versus time. So it means that most people, at some point, um, set up house with the best person that they can find so far. This, there's a huge amount of uh, data from social psychology that bears this out. One of the most obvious manifestations is assorted of mating, namely that people are, in a couple, are generally equally matched in terms of overall desirability, which is exactly what you would get in a marketplace in which you basically sell yourself for the best possible return. But there is something that is left out of this account. We all know people, maybe some of us are people, who are uh, fixed up with what on paper seems like the ideal match. The, uh, the person is, uh, is nice looking and uh, nice and entertaining and smart and so on, but uh, you just don't hit it off. Cupid didn't strike, uh, we didn't, uh, nothing clicked, the earth didn't move and so on. There seems to be an irrational part of love so on top of this general narrowing down the market by uh, value, and that there's um, kind of a capriciousness to it and uh, an involuntariness. No one can will themselves to fall in love. The question is, uh, why? why? Why do we seem to be designed this way? Well, the economists point out that there's a problem for the rational strategy called the commitment problem. Namely, if you're, you are um, setting up house with the best person you found so far, it leaves your partner in a vulnerable position, namely that when someone better shows up, which will happen according to the law of averages, it will be rational for you to dump your partner at that point and go live with uh, you know, Tom Cruise or Cindy Crawford, who just moved in <laughs> next door. They're, being able to anticipate this, they would have been foolish to have uh, hooked up with you to begin with because a um, commitment has, has costs. There are foregone opportunities to uh, fall in love with someone else. Uh, you sell your stereo when you move in with someone, and there's a, you <laughs> may, right, may bear children, and so on. So how do you set up a situation in which what's really in the long run interests of both people can be executed given that it may be rational for either of them to desert, therefore making it irrational for the other one to commit to begin with? Well, a solution is if you don't decide to fall in love for rational reasons, you can't decide to fall out of love for rational reasons. That if there is something that's visibly involuntary about, uh, as we say, Cupid striking, about you uh, selecting as a, a person as the one that you're committed to, then you're, in a sense, guaranteeing your promise. So that romantic love, in this view, is a guarantor of the implicit promise you make in a romantic relationship to spend your life with someone and to forsake all others. It's an example of a large range of situations that economists discuss where lack of freedom or rationality is an advantage. Uh, one example is legal documents such as leases, that the signing a lease which re restricts the freedom of both the tenant and the landlord works to the advantage of the tenant because the landlord can't kick him out and works to the advantage of the landlord because the tenant can't uh, leave suddenly and um, leave the, the landlord holding the bag. Likewise, uh, the, there's a part of the law that says that corporations have the right to sue and the right to be sued. Now, the right to be sued 
What kind of right is that? Well, it's the right to enter into promises with someone who might be hurt as a result. If your, some of your options are restricted, you have, are in a better position to have your promises taken seriously. I'll give you one other example. The law that allows a bank to foreclose on a mortgage and repossess your house makes it worth the bank's while to lend you the money to buy the house to begin with, and so, paradoxically, works to the advantage of the borrower. Uh, some evidence for this analysis of love as a kind of emotional guarantor analogous to a contract is that romantic love is universal. Contrary to what most intellectuals believe, romantic love is not a recent invention of Hollywood scriptwriters, but there's evidence for it in the ethnographic record in uh, all cultures. That in, um, if you look at the content of courtship strategies, you see that there's a strong orientation to the individual. If you were to murmur into a date's ear, you're the, uh, the best looking, richest, smartest person that I've been able to find so far, <laughs> it would probably kill the romantic mood. Uh, what you want to say is, I love you because you're you. I like the way you walk. I like the way you talk. I can't help it. Uh, when I gave this talk, by the way, at an MIT faculty seminar, one of the professors in attendance on hearing this point went, that's what I've been doing wrong. <laughs> So, love has, and emotions in general, are strongly tied to the body. It's one of the most salient uh, properties of emotion, in particular to involuntary systems of the body, such as sweating, palpitating, facial expressions, um, croaking tone of voice, uh, goofy looks in your eyes, and so on. This would make sense if uh, the point of the emotions is to convince someone that you're dealing with that the uh, emotion is heartfelt and uh, not a sham promise that's about to be broken. Now, if passionate love and loyalty are guarantors that promises are not double crosses, you can extend the theory in the, uh, by changing the uh, sign and show that passionate vengeance or a sense of honor that, you know, if you insult my honor, I will have to challenge you to a duel and so on, are guarantors that your threats are not bluffs. There's a problem with uh, threatening someone, namely that they, you might have to carry it out. And often it's expensive to carry out a threat. The person that you're threatening knows that and can therefore, as we say, call your bluff. If you're driven by some unquenchable emotion to uh, avenge an insult or to carry out a, uh, th the consequences of a threat, no matter how harmful they are to your own interests, the threat therefore becomes credible. This principle is uh, best illustrated by Dashiell Hammett in the Mal Maltese Falcon, including the film adaptation by John Huston, which Bogart says, uh, you can't kill me, to si the Sidney Greenstreet character. You need me to retrieve the Falcon. And Sidney Greenstreet uh, explains, that's an attitude, sir, that calls for the most delicate judgment on both sides. Because as you know, sir, in the heat of action, men are likely to forget where their best interests lie and let their emotions carry them away. Uh, the the uh, best explanation I've seen for uh, how paradoxical tactics can make sacrifice of rationality and uh, freedom work to your advantage. Uh, let me conc uh, conclude. Um, there's a, a worry that the approach to the mind that I've been arguing for might be seen as a kind of cynical view of human nature. That many people are uncomfortable with the idea that the mind is a system of computers designed by natural selection to promote uh, survival and reproduction. It seems like a, uh, a dark view of the uh, human condition. Uh, on the other hand, there are some uh, undeniable facts that uh, motivate this view. One, I, no, I don't think any rational person knowing about modern brain science can deny that the mind is a product of the brain, that the brain is a product of evolution, and that evolution is not guaranteed to produce niceness. It's bound to uh, result in organisms that sometimes pursue their own interests. On the other hand, I don't think of it as a cynical view uh, because of some implications of the three ideas that I think uh, have to be taken together. One of them, computation, uh, leads us to expect that the mind is not just a set of crude drives and reflex, reflexes or um, uh, uncontrollable energy or bad plumbing, but rather we're fitted with intricate, ingenious, and powerful software, which is, uh, actually gives room for uh, optimism and human ability to uh, solve our problems. That 
The idea of evolution leads us to believe that the legacy of biology is not just greed and aggression and lust, a territorial imperative, uh, a rapacious sex drive, and so on. But if you really take it to its logical extension, biology has also given us the kinder, gentler emotions like love, friendship, and a sense of justice. Th that's the legacy of evolution as much as the ignoble emotions. Finally, with specialization, if the mind is not a single substance, but a, uh, a system of a partly autonomous and competing parts, one part of the mind can sometimes outsmart the others. I'll leave it at that, and uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, we have uh, arrangements for questions from the audience. You mentioned that, that disgust was a sort of intuitive microbiology. Does is there a very long history of disgust? Certainly, uh, what's disgusting to a, to a uh, Tibetan uh, is not the same as what's disgusting to a, a, uh, a suburban American. Uh, absolutely. There are great cross-cultural differences in which, which items are disgusting and which ones are palatable. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the um, existence of disgust is universal, although the items that are on the um, palatable list differ radically from culture to culture. And there are cultures that eat worms and insects and all kinds of uh, gross things. But they, they will often themselves find certain foods uh, un that the thought of eating them is uh, unbearable. And uh, food taboos, are, which are almost universal, are very closely linked to the emotion of disgust. Most people find the tabooed foods in their culture to be disgusting. So there has to be a learning process where as you grow up, you basically, I think there's, there's documentation that children's tastes in uh, food in the, around the age of three contract, and that's when you get the finicky eater. Then they expand outward to what uh, their friends eat and what their parents give them with it within certain uh, boundaries. And it's that learning phase that probably accounts for the cross-cultural differences. I, I guess um, I, I would take issue with uh, the notion that, that all the adaptations have to be so specialized. Uh, when you look at sensory systems, there are plenty of um, sensory systems and sensory capabilities that we have that are very general. You know, we, w our eyes didn't evolve to read uh, to read text or to uh, look at paintings or any of these things, yet we can do these things very easily because our visual system is very, very much uh, a generalist system for uh, understanding um, visual regularities in the world. The same may be true of all sorts of cognitive abilities. Um, I mean, I don't think anyone thinks that we evolved to listen to music and to play music, uh, but um, but we certainly have that and. A more generalist uh, notion of adaptation, where one thinks in terms of the the evolution of general cognitive um, um, capacities, extending essentially the computational uh, capacity of the machine in in by 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 simply extending the cortical surface area, you get all sorts of abilities to iterate and and deal with sequences of things that across the board give you all sorts of different capabilities. I think that uh, my own view is that, the, uh, that there obviously, obviously we do uh, many things that are not adaptations, in the, specific adaptations in the sense of uh, specific things that led to enhanced survival and reproduction in our evolutionary environment. But many of them may come from uh, combinations of different specializations uh, working together or at cross purposes. Reading is actually a good example because even though we do have the capacity to translate visual forms into um, uh, language. It's not something that comes easy. 
And the fact that it is not an adaptation is visible in the fact that it's so hard to teach children to read, that illiteracy is so high, that dyslexia is so high. If you contrast it to something like spoken language, which children acquire without lessons, without instruction, and with a very high success rate, you do get a, um, a, a very striking contrast between a specialization and something that's been co-opted after the fact. So it is true, we certainly can co-opt um, some kind of extra brain tissue to forge a pathway between the eyes and the language system. But the fact that it's such a, a long, hard slog shows that there is a difference between what we are adapted to and what we aren't. I think in the case of music and the arts, it really comes from an interplay between two parts of the mind, both of which may be um, uh, specialized for different things, and then give you a third product in combination. Namely, there are some parts of the mind that are designed to deliver us with little jol jolts of pleasure for, uh, to, uh, in response to being in environments that were healthful or uh, understandable. There are, that's why we like sweet things, we like temperate climates, we like uh, environments with certain sounds and certain sights. There's another part of the mind that's a, a cause and effect reasoner that figures out how to bring about effects in the world. You put them together and you get a creature that uh, rises to a, a biologically pointless challenge, namely how to f f design an environment that stimulates our pleasure circuits and causes us to experience pleasure from stimuli that were not originally uh, enhancing a fitness. So paintings and gourmet cuisine and junk food and many other cases are, are instances where we've, the smart parts of our brain, figure out how to tickle our pleasure circuits for no biological purpose, but uh, simply to give us pleasure. But the, but the hedonic aspects of music and, and the arts don't, still don't explain why it is that we can recognize musical, complicated musical uh, passages uh, without, I mean, I, I don't believe that that, that hunter-gatherers had Beethoven, let's say. No. And, but but, but we're, we're nevertheless able to readily uh, hear, appreciate uh, those sorts of complex sequences. Um, so, so it seems that we have much more general cognitive capacities and capabilities. The, the system seems much more general in its in its capabilities than, than uh, y you yeah. seem to... Uh, it, 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 certainly, it certainly might, and I discuss actually the... Music is a particularly complicated case, which I discuss it in a section in, in um, How the Mind Works. My own... It's one interpretation of evolutionarily novel activities is that the mind is uh, general purpose. The interpretation that I favor is that what looks like its general purpose is actually a collection of more specialized faculties uh, interacting and giving you an outcome that wasn't in the uh, uh, conducive, necessarily conducive to survival in a foraging lifestyle. But that could be a, a two different ways of looking at the same phenomenon. I certainly don't doubt that that phenomenon is real. I'll preface my question by saying that I note my pulse has picked up, so you can assume this is a sincere question. Um, you, in the beginning, made some analogies between the brain and other, bo uh, other body organs, uh, of which some of them could be construed as being quite complex. But for the brain, you choose to use the word mind as opposed to brain. And I, I know there are other terms for other organs, in common usage, particularly, say, the heart. Um, could you comment on why you choose to go to mind and not stay with brain, or just the, the duality, the relationship between the two? Yeah, I think the, the question is, if I uh, understand it, why talk about mind as opposed to directly talking about uh, nervous tissue, about neurons and neuro, neurotransmitters and so on? The, the answer is that I think a lot of the regularities of behavior and emotion are really at the level of the information processing that nervous tissue accomplishes uh, that can't really be seen at the microscopic level of the actual uh, synapses and physiological properties uh, in nervous tissue itself. It's uh, obviously nothing at the, in the mind can happen without there being some corresponding physiological change at the nervous system. But it may, in many cases, I think it's too microscopic a level of analysis to uh, give you insight as to what's going on. I mean, an analogy is um, there's, in, in criticizing a, a book, 
there's no information in the book that isn't carried in the arrangement of ink on the page, but if you were to put a page of a book under a microscope and look at the ink, you'd be missing the point of what the book is about. And I think similarly in the case of the uh, brain, uh, it, it is nothing but nervous activity that gives rise to thought, but that looking at uh, cranking up the microscopes, microscopes that you're looking at nervous tissue will miss the higher order regularities that the system as a whole is designed to uh, give you. Yeah? You, uh, you don't really brush your hair with a comb, do you? Uh, no, I don't. I can't get a, <laughs> can't get a comb through this hair. <laughs> I, I, I bring it along in case I forget a stirrer. Yeah. Yes? The question is, what kind of predictive power comes from reverse engineering? I'll give you a couple of examples. Say in the education system, you would expect that there would be a very strong contrast between uh, cognitive abilities that our ancestors had a chance to exercise in a hunting and gathering environment and those that are much more recent inventions and dependent on agricultural civilizations. I already alluded to one, namely uh, reading versus spoken language. It's not a trivial example because many parts of the country have been taken over by a philosophy of reading instruction called whole language, which maintains that children can learn to read in the same way they learn to talk. Namely, if you just immerse them, you laugh, but the state of California adopted the system and watched its reading scores plummet to the bottom of, of the uh, nation. This is exactly what you would, what you would predict and what had been predict, predicted from a uh, reverse engineering evolutionary uh, perspective, which said reading was only invented by the Canaanites a couple of thousand years ago in one part of the world. There's no way that the circuitry of the brain could have evolved to take account of it. You're not going to teach a kid to read unless you uh, go through some drill, some practice, some unnatural activities, quite unlike spoken language. Math education, the same uh, scandal is being played out where uh, there's a philosophy of math education that says that if you throw kids together and let them solve problems while interacting socially, they'll rediscover the 2,000-year history of Western mathematics. This is, it's based on, you know, a little nugget of truth, namely that we, we do have a sense of number and that children display it even in the crib, but this is very different from the kind of mathematical reasoning that depends on written symbols and calculations and so on. So that, that would be one example. Another would be in psychopathology to say that if we have complex neural systems dedicated to particular emotions like anxiety and depression, there may be circumstances in which those responses are actually, um, that treating them directly with drugs may not always be the best thing in terms of having a person come to grips with uh, decisions, major decisions in their life, that there may be times in which some anxiety, some depression is actually a, a good thing. In the same way that a uh, physician has to distinguish between reactions of the body that are defenses of the body against invaders and those that are uh, harmful, in psychiatry we probably have to distinguish more between uh, mental reactions that, however unpleasant, may be uh, adaptive in terms of motivating us to make hard decisions and those that really are maladaptive. So those would be two, two examples. Yeah. Yes? There was an article a, a while ago about um, somebody who was doing research and they found that the brain cells tended to operate on their own and so when, they were, when a person was sleeping and there was no input, the person would be dreaming. When they were awake, they'd be day, daydreaming. Can you comment on that article? I mean. Um, you know, what was, what's the function of this? Do you agree with that, first of all, that the, the, the brain cells are constantly firing and producing images or whatever? And it's, that it, uh, it's certainly true that, that um, neurons, uh, uh, I think virtually all neurons, are spontaneously active, I mean, if you're alive. And that, um, however, the function of dreaming is, I, I think, is still a great mystery, as is the function of sleep, for example, for that matter. Um, dreaming has been given a number of um, psychological explanations. Freud's are the most famous, which I think probably don't hold water. We don't know whether uh, dreaming serves some physiological function of replenishing a neurotransmitter. Again, the, uh, 
there isn't very good evidence that it does. There's some evidence from my department, Brain and Cognitive Sciences, that uh, dreaming may have a role in consolidating memory. That's a, another hypothesis. But I consider that actually to be still a, uh, a mystery, something that it's not obvious what the function of this spontaneous neural activity is. Uh, I think we have time for a couple more questions, and then Stephen's going to sign books in the lobby. Uh, I have a question about uh, your view on how the mind creates or why the mind creates value and <laughs> morality. Y you touched on it maybe a little bit when you spoke about honor there, something along the lines of it's a good idea not to lie or maybe we ought not to lie because then our statements wouldn't be taken truthfully when we want them to be. Um, maybe you have something to say along those lines, but hopefully it doesn't go along the lines of disgust where it varies from, you know, culture to culture, where, you know, maybe it's okay in a certain culture if they steal your shoes to steal. I mean, maybe we ought to steal their family's shoes back or something like this, where we want to say, look, that's, that's wrong. Yeah. So can you say something a little bit maybe about that? Yeah, there, there are um, several different uh, levels. One of them is I certainly, like many philosophers, um, I think there's a distinction between what is right or wrong and what people or different cultures consider to be right or, right or wrong. So I, I'm, in that sense, I'm a, what philosophers would call a moral realist. Um, and so even if cultures vary in what they consider right or wrong, it doesn't necessarily force you to be a relativist and say, oh, who knows whether, say, genital mutilation is morally right or not. If some other culture practices it, who are we to say that it's wrong? So I don't subscribe to that. Um, I think it is a bit like disgust at the psychological side, namely that I. Th uh, I think all cultures have a strong sense of what's just and unjust, what's right and wrong, that are based on a core that's probably common, plus some variation that we can even see in our own recent history in cases like um, sexual mores, uh, um, animal rights, slavery, going back a little bit farther, uh, and so on. Probably the core that's uh, the core that's common is a sense of loyalty to kin, which uh, I think even modern philosophers recognize that someone would be justified in saving their own child as opposed to someone else's child if only one could be saved. Uh, uh, another part is reciprocity, namely that in extending a uh, favor, in accepting a favor, you're obligated to uh, return it. Both of those have straightforward uh, Darwinian, Darwinian explanations. The extra twist, which I think you alluded to, is that on top of the, these sort of family love, and which is basically being selfish to your own genes, and quid pro quo, which is looking for a net gain on favor trading, there may, as you suggested, be another layer where we actually have a sincere um, compulsion to follow codes of honor or moral belief perhaps because the best way to convince someone that you mean something is to mean it. So that if a part of our brain is wired so that we really do act morally, not for short-term or even long-term selfish gain, but because we're kind of wired up to behave morally, and to the extent that that is detectable by the parties that we deal with, they, we will get uh, more respect, better uh, terms, the kind of um, uh, honor and respect that a moral person gets. So paradoxically, a kind of selfish analysis may, in an environment of other people always trying to determine whether you're sincere or not, may lead to the evolution of some amount of sincerity uh, in moral beliefs. Yeah. Hi. Uh, with your implication that the brain is a specialization, a collection of specialization, that it's not as completely general as people might think, that there might be a limit to the amount of uh, capability that the brain has. What does this say about uh, the evolution, or the current evolution, or future evolution of the brain, or maybe perhaps the evolution of the brain? The, well, the current and future evolution uh, is, it's not clear that there's going to there's gonna be any. Um, we know that species can certainly uh, once they've achieved a, a certain form, can stagnate for hundreds of millions of years. Uh, and evolution, because it's not a process of progress, it's not that there's some momentum in expanding the brain or leading to us to be smart that will, can be extrapolated. Uh, we don't really 
we can't, I don't think we can predict future human evolution by extrapolating past evolution simply because that's not the way natural selection works. And also because the engine of natural selection is differential survival and reproduction, and we have adopted a lifestyle that makes it hard for that to cause evolutionary change. We're scattered all over the planet. We travel and interbreed at the drop of a hat. Uh, we lurch from lifestyle to lifestyle. It's difficult, if not impossible, to say if we're going to be doing any more uh, evolving. And the answer may be that we, we're not. I mean, we, we're certainly not going to know in, in this lifetime. Yes? Um, where is the Excuse me. This should be the last question, OK? Oh, that was the last question? Yeah. This is the last question, yes. Where is Stephen Jay Gould making a mistake? Where is Stephen Jay Gould making a mistake? Um, I would say in um, underestimating the engineering demands of mundane mental activities like uh, seeing, walking, retrieving information, recognizing faces, um, forming relationships. That I think that uh, Steve Gould would agree, has agreed, that when you do have Despite the fact that he thinks that natural selection and adaptation are overrated, he does concede that you need to evoke them whenever you see signs of engineering complexity in the natural world. So he wouldn't disagree that the eye, for example, is a product of natural selection. I say that the mind is like the eye. That just in fact, in fact, what is the eye is connected to the brain, and the eye wouldn't work if it was just floating in a socket unconnected to anything. If you've got a complex eye, it almost uh, presupposes that you've got complex neural circuitry connected to it. The same engineering complexity that forces him to concede that natural selection uh, evolved the eye, I say, applies in just as much measure to our uh, perceptual mechanisms, emotional mechanisms, cognitive mechanisms in the rest of the brain. So I think that's the disagreement is really, I am a psychologist. I study these processes. They impress me with their complexity. That's why I see them as being in the same camp as the eye. Steve is a paleontologist. Uh, I think he uh, doesn't give adequate recognition to the engineering complexity of mental events, and that's why he's apt to say that perhaps it could just be a, uh, a byproduct. Thank you. Okay, thank you.